Morning, everybody. Glad you're here today. We are talking about making a restart in your life. And uh, two weeks ago, we talked about um, we talked about what it would be to restart your life and maybe some things that you'd need to do. And so a couple things we talked about was, one, that if you really wanted to make a restart in your life, that you would have to sometimes draw a line in the sand. So sometimes there's things that you've said, you know, I've had enough of this one thing, or this is as far as I'm going to go with this one thing, and I just need to cut this thing out of my life. And so sometimes you just may need to make a hard decision and say, this is not going to be part of my life anymore, so you need to draw a line in the sand. The other thing that can make a huge change in your life, if you want to make a restart, is to hide God's word in your heart. And really, there's no better example than this than the quiz team who did an awesome job in Kentucky this past uh, weekend, or actually last weekend, right? Last weekend, and just, I mean, they, they, they did, how'd they do? Yeah, it's awesome, right? And, and what an awesome example for us. I mean, these, these teens are taking tons of their time to memorize. This, this year, it's the book of Acts, and spending a lot of time memorizing huge chunks, if not the entire book of Acts. I mean, that's impressive. And so, you know, it, that inspires me to think, wow, I can probably do a much better job of hiding God's word in my heart so that when things happen in my life, I can rely on the things that God wants me to be thinking. Uh, so just try to memorize. So I don't know if you've thought about that or if you've been challenged to do that, but I'd say if you haven't, think about hiding God's word in your heart. And then the other part that we talked about last week was how do we do some restarts as a church? And as a church, we're looking at a few ways to restart groups. Um, we've been looking at groups for a long time now and thinking how can we make groups even better than they are now? And so we were looking at the life of Jesus. And if you look at the life of Jesus, we sometimes use these circles at Free Church to talk about Jesus' life and how he kind of hung around people. He hung around large crowds of people. Um, he also had his disciples, his 12 disciples. They were kind of like his small group. Uh, Jesus also had his inner circle, which these were people um, that were very close to him. Peter, James, and John were the disciples that were in his inner circle. And he could confide, confide in them. And often he would go and talk to only these guys about personal things. And then he also spent a lot of time alone in solitude and in prayer and replenishing with God with nobody else around, just he and God out in the wilderness. And we think about, well, how does that translate into, you know, the 21st century? How does that make sense in our life today? And we'd say that, well, you we can probably say that in our life we have the worship service. Uh, we have small groups. Many, most churches have small groups of some sort. Uh, we have a close few. And you also, you know, you need to spend time alone as well, replenishing and, and reading God's word and praying uh, and spending time with God. So the problem is, is that in our society right now, most people will end up doing a few things, which is this. They'll end up doing the worship service, which is the big group of people. And they'll end up maybe spending some time alone in prayer, reading their Bible. But we miss out on these two other super important pieces. We miss out on getting involved with a small group. And what the studies are saying is over the last 20 or 30 years, as you do study, as they're studying America, is that people have less and less few really close friends. And so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of you know, important to remember that Having a few close friends are really important, and I think with the way that society is going and the way that you know, we're connecting with people on, de on devices and online now, maybe we're having less and less interactions with people, which kind of is actually maybe separating people to some degree. So we're concerned about that, and we're trying to think, you know, if Jesus had this healthy balance of community and intimacy and privacy, then um, how do we do that? And so what we're doing is saying we want to make sure that somehow we incorporate small groups and having a close few into the life of every person of our church, or at least offer opportunities so that we can be at least headed in the right direction, and we hope people will jump on board with that. So we were talking about how to do that in groups, and uh, you know, it, we also looked last week at the beginnings of the church. So when the church was just starting up, um, Luke, who was a doctor back in, in Jesus' time, uh, he wrote about the life and times of Jesus and the life and times of the early church, and in the book of Acts, he describes the early church in Acts chapter 2. He says this, all the believers were what? Oh, we can do better than that. All the believers were what? They were together, and they had everything in common. And selling their possessions and their goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together, where? In the temple courts, which was church. So they met in church all the time. So they were together together. They had a lot in common, and they spent a lot of time doing things together, and especially hanging out at church together. Luke continues, and he says this, they broke bread where? In their homes. And they what? 
That's always a good thing, right? You get to eat together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord did what? Yeah, he added to their number daily those who are being saved, those who are coming in contact with the risen Christ. Now that's, you know, kind of interesting because this is such a great picture of what the early church was. Um, but don't get, don't get, you know, misguided. The early church had tons of problems. Tons of problems. I mean, this was kind of like the honeymoon phase, right? Everything was fantastic right here. But then as you read the letters that Paul wrote to all the churches as they're being planted all over the place, these churches had, had monumental huge problems. Um, But God was still working through this group of people, which is kind of, you know, a fellowship of failed people, right? A fellowship of of failures, of people who are flawed, a fellowship of the flawed. And uh, God has always used flawed people to do his work uh, because everybody is flawed. And so as we look at this and we think, you know, if we're considering how to restart something in our life, we need to figure out how to make these changes in our life stick. So let me say that again. If you're thinking about restarting something in your life, it's super important to say, how do I make these changes stick? Because so many people, we talked about last week, how many, so many people start the new year on a really good note and they have all these great intentions and they make goals for themselves and they're going to lose this many pounds and there's, they're going to read this many books or, or whatever your new year's resolution is. But then people fall off really, really fast. What we're going to talk about today is kind of a continuation of last week, but I just want to kind of make the point on how important it is to have people in your life. Because here's what I believe is true. The most effective way to make changes in your life is through the support and encouragement of other people. The most effective way to make changes in your life is through the support and encouragement of other people. When you have other people in your life who are encouraging you and who are supporting you and who are cheering you on and who are helping you and who are talking you through things, when you have people in your life that are helping you do that, you'll be way more successful. And this is not not anything shocking, right? You know this. If people really want to lose weight, what do they do? They get a personal trainer or they they get involved with a team sport. Why? Because there's accountability. That person's going to help them get get to where they want to go. If you want to you know, further your education or deepen the information that you know as you're studying. You'll get involved with a study group or you'll find a tutor and you'll learn because you know that once you get connected with somebody, they're going to help you learn more and be better. If you're, you know, want to be a better person who better exercises and and you're more, you have a better fitness routine, then you're going to get involved with a sport or you're going to get involved with a personal trainer. Again, these, we all know this, right? If you want to do something successful and you really want to make it work, most people connect with other people who are trying to do the same thing. And when you connect with people who are trying to do the same thing, you walk with each other down this path, and you're much more successful because it's just not you on your own. Because when it's us on our own, you know that those potato chips are calling you in the kitchen, right? I mean, you know that, right? You know it's just too hard to go to the gym in the morning. You can just sleep another half an hour and save that time. And, you know, we, do, we make all these excuses when we're on our own. But if someone tells us that they're going to meet us at the gym... Ah, man. I mean, it makes us frustrated, right? They're going to be waiting there for me. I better get up and go do it. Or, you know, I mean, there's ways that you can get accountability in your life that help you. So as Christians, we need our group to grow. We need our group to stay healthy, and we need to stay faithful to God. And so our group is the church. That's our group. So in your faith, your group is the church. And so today, we want to kind of address this one big question And it's a huge question, especially nowadays. It seems like it's a bigger question than it was in the past. But the question is this. Why church? Why church? I think we we live in such an individualistic society that many people look at the church and go, I don't need that. I can read the Bible by myself. I can pray at home. I can do my own little thing. I can walk in the woods and I just feel God around me. You know, like, I don't don't need anybody else. I'll just do this by myself because... We are Americans. We, have the, we, are, we are rugged individuals and we can pull up our bootstraps and, and we can make it happen on our own. But what happens is you see more and more people who shipwreck their faith, as the Apostle Paul would say, because they get separated from the, the one thing that could help them the most. It's being part of the body of God. It's being part of this thing we call church. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to convince you. I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to 
persuade you that the church is not just important, but it's absolutely necessary to having a faith. It's necessary. And so as you look in the Bible, there's a few things that we're going to pull out, basically four ways, I think, uh, four reasons that you should commit to a local church. No matter who you are, no matter what country you're in, no matter what culture you're from, there's four things that I would say that you should consider when we talk about the church being this necessity. Here's the first thing. Why church? Because Jesus established it. Jesus established it. Jesus affirmed it. He's the one who said, I'm starting this whole thing. And if you are a believer in Jesus and you're not part of the church, then you're at a huge loss already because you're not doing what he asks us to do. And, and, and so many people, I think, have been hurt by the church or have, been, um, have had bad experiences in church, and that's just because the church is a fellowship of the flawed. It just is, and we're all broken, and we all have issues. You know you have issues, right? We all have issues. I have issues. And so no church is perfect, you know? And if you think a church is perfect, the minute you walk in, it's not perfect anymore, right? Because you're there, right? Because we all have issues, right? I mean, every church has its issues. But Jesus established it. Here's what Jesus says, and Matthew records this, as Jesus is talking to Peter, who we we would say Peter is like one of the foundational pieces of the church. And when it got started, uh, Jesus started with Peter. He said, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will what? Build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The evil that's in this world will not overcome it. And you know, the church, which is the body of Christ, has been a force to reckon with for thousands of years. Why? Because Jesus established it. Jesus said, I'm going to build this thing, and it'll never go down. Now, it may diminish It may fluctuate in attendance, but the church, the church that I'm going to build, which means every local church on the planet right now, is mine. And I'm establishing it, and it's going to be a force to reckon with. It's going to be a force for good in this world. People's lives are going to be changed because of the church. God has always worked through groups of people. Now, he works in individuals in amongst those people, but he uses the church to do all his work in this world. We are Jesus' hands. We are his feet as the church. And when you get away from the church, you are not part of it. You are separated from the thing that Jesus established. And it's a huge thing just to consider, right? Why is the church important? Because Jesus established it and said, this is how we're going to do it. This is how I'm going to work in the world is through this thing, this organization called the local church. Here's the second thing I think we need to realize about the church Every person has a natural longing for belonging. Every person has a natural longing for belonging. In Romans, here's what the Bible says when Paul writes, each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are what? Many form what? Yeah, one body. And each member what? Belongs to all the others. So there's this thing of belonging to the body of Christ. So it's kind of interesting. Paul uses this analogy quite often in the scriptures. He'll say things like, we are the body of Christ. And if you're an eye, you're an eye. And that you shouldn't be jealous of the hand if you're an eye. You're an eye for a reason and you should just stay an eye, right? But I think sometimes in the body of Christ, we want to be something we're not. But God's saying, hey, I made you the way you are and you have a job to do. You have a particular function to perform in the body of Christ. And with, if you're not a part of the body of Christ, then you're separate. And a body is not a body unless it's all together. And so as we look at our congregation, as you look at churches, everybody is needed and necessary to make the body happen because it makes it healthy, it makes it function properly because everybody's together. The church is a place where you can belong. And the church is, you know, important because it helps solidify who we are as a people and what we're trying to do. And we can do a lot more together than we can apart. In fact, if you look down through history, people who spent lots of time alone ended up um, in, in really bad situations. In fact, the early pioneers, as they were traveling across America, and the early settlers, as they were settling across the plains, um, a lot of them endured what they called this thing called, they called prairie sickness. Prairie sickness was basically somebody who was on the road to being led to be insane because of no contact with other people. 
Because, and there's this, there's this idea that with prairie sickness, you can just, you're, you're, almost, you're almost overwhelmed by your circumstances because the circumstances are just unending. And so what they'd say that if somebody lived in like a, a, a cabin, like in, you know, I don't know where, South Dakota, right? And you get out of the cabin and as soon as you step out of the cabin, you don't see anything except the horizon as far as you can see on every direction. It's almost so big, it overwhelms you. So what they would do is they'd build things around their houses so that, there's, so that it's breaking up this infinite landscape they have so that it didn't, so it made them, didn't make them feel so, so alone and so isolated. But they would often go crazy because they were so, uh, they just were so overwhelmed by their loneliness. People were not designed to live alone. We were designed to live in community. And the church needs you in particular to help God accomplish the things he wants to do on this earth. There's this illustration that's been told for years, and I just think it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's really kind of a great illustration. It sticks with you. It's an illustration of there's a, um, somebody, a leader in a church who decided they didn't want to be part of the church anymore, so they stopped coming to church, and the pastor went over to this person's house, and they were talking, sitting there by the fire as they talked, and the guy was saying, I just don't, I just don't want to be a part of the church. Here's the things that have happened to me. Here's how I've been hurt. And as they're talking, the pastor takes some tongs from the fireplace, and he takes an ember out of the fire, and he puts it on the hearth. And they continue talking, and he's, you know, he's kind of, the guy's pouring out his heart, and the pastor's, you know, trying to encourage him that the church is still, a, you know, he should still want to be part of the church, and he's valuable and needed. Um, and after a while, he, he's explaining the importance of it, and he reaches down with his bare hand, and he picks up the ember. And he says, you know, it doesn't take long before, you, when you're separated from the body of Christ, that you become really really cold. And they threw the ember back into the fire and it became hot again. I think it's a really great picture because when you are around people and you all have the same goals in mind and you all have the same, you all have the same motivation and you're all headed in the same direction, that stuff is what fires you up. It's what keeps you hot. It's what keeps you on your toes. It's what keeps things moving forward in your life. And your faith stops growing if you don't have people around you because this is the way God designed us. He designed us to live life in community. So every person has this natural longing for belonging, and the church fulfills that function for people who believe in Jesus. Here's the third thing. The third thing is that for about, about the church is that it helps you become all that God wants for you. It helps you become all that God wants from you. So God would say, none of us are completed. None of us are finished. The Bible even says that, you know, God began a good work in you, but he, and he'll be faithful to complete it, but you're not done yet right? We're all kind of half-baked. That's just the bottom line, right? We're all kind of half-baked. We're not done yet. God's not finished. Um, here's what it says in the Psalms. David writes, the righteous will what? Flourish. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted where? In the house of the Lord. Yeah, planted in the house of the Lord. They will what? Flourish in the courts of our God. When you are among God's people, you will flourish in your faith. You know, but there's some, there's some risk to be involved with other people. There's some risk to opening up your heart to other people. There's some risk for letting people into your life and telling them stuff that's not going great. What? It's a risk that, you know, you could be exposed. You could be seen as a weak person. You could be seen as somebody who needs help. Um, but guess what? We all need help. And if we don't allow ourselves to, be, to take the risk to know other people well, then we will never benefit from having them know us well. But once somebody loves you for who you are, including your flaws, man, that's just a great, great relationship. Because they know all the junk in your life and they like you despite it, just like God does. And that's what we hope happens from the church. I mean, when you're with people of God, if I look at my life and say, what have I learned from the church? I've learned a million things. I've learned how to be a good parent. I've learned how to be a godly parent. I've learned how to be generous with the things that I have. I've learned to serve other people in ways that I wouldn't have. A lot of people aren't walking around saying, you've got to serve somebody. You've got to serve other people. You've got to be thinking of other people. Most organizations are not out to do that. They're out to help further the organization. Being in church has t- taught me what the Bible's about. Being in church has explained to me why God cares about me and my problems. Being in the church helps you understand why you have a place on this earth. Why are you here? Church helps you figure out why you're here. You know, you learn to live out your faith when you live among other believers. And, I, and I've been... I've been challenged and I've been, um, I've been convicted of things that, are, that were in my life that I knew I needed to change. Uh, and just as I look back through my life, there's been many times where 
I've done something that wasn't right, or I thought a thought that wasn't right, or was theologically incorrect, and I would have somebody come up to me later and say, hey, you know, I was thinking about what you said. I'm really wondering what you meant by that or what that meant. And, and a lot of times, it'll make me change my belief system. Why? Because I'm, another person is challenging me, helping me become a better person. And that's what the body of Christ does. It helps us become better people because there's stuff in your life that needs to be changed. There's stuff in my life that needs to be changed. There's ideas that you have in your head that are wrong. And there's ideas that I have in my head that are wrong. And as people challenge those things in our lives, they help us to become better people. They help us to become closer to God. They help us to become a better Christian. And so people, having people around you is huge because it does help you to become all that God wants you to be because none of us are finished yet. And we all have a ways to go. Here's a fourth thing. And, and this, is one, this is a huge one why I believe the church is really important. Because there's safety in numbers. There's safety in numbers. You know, probably when you were younger, this, it, when I was younger, um, my parents would always make sure that if I was going someplace that was at night or it was late at night or it was at someplace that wasn't that safe, they'd always say, make sure that you go, you're, never, you're not alone. Make sure there's people with you. And it's the same thing with, in your faith. We need to make sure we have people with us as we walk our faith walk because being alone is dangerous. How many of you ever watch um, nature shows or National Geographic stuff? Anybody? Oh, wow, there's quite a few of you. Yeah, I can turn on, I can turn on, a, I can turn on a nature program, and it basically clears the living room instantly in our house. Uh, and I'm just sitting there alone watching, watching this stuff, right? Uh, but, um, you know, I do like watching that stuff. And, um, you know, there's, there's a common theme that you'll see that happens a lot. You'll be, and you'll, you'll, as soon as I start explaining the scene, you'll understand what happens. Because this happens all the time in nature. Um, you'll be watching lions, right? Lions are great, aren't they? I mean, lions look so soft and cuddly. They, most of the time, they're just lazing around, right, in the sun, like, just, like, laying on a rock, and just, like, so, like, they look so content and comfortable and soft and fluffy, you know? And uh, they look like you just want to go give them a hug. And so they show the lions, and the lions are licking themselves and licking their cubs, and they're looking at each other, and you're like, oh, look at the lions, they're so nice. And then, and then they show the wildebeests, you know, and the wildebeests are like running around in the middle of the desert, you know, and making dust, you know. The wildebeests have no other function other than to make dust in the desert. That's all they do, you know, they make dust. And so they're running around in their pack, and, um, but then they'll show, you know, then they'll show uh, one like a little wildebeest, we'll call this little wildebeest Luther, or Luther, we'll call him Luther, right? So we have Luther here, who's getting bumped around in his big herd, you know, and he doesn't like it. And then somebody says something that's not nice to him, and he's like, boy, you know, I really don't like being a part of this herd, it's, it's really a pain in my neck. And so as the herd's running around creating dust, he decides, I'm going to go over here. And so Luther starts to head away from the group, and as he's heading away from the group, he gets distracted by a butterfly, Right? So Luther's like, wow, look at this butterfly over here. And so Luther's over here. And the pack is already, like, the herd is already, like, left. And as soon as Luther starts looking at the butterfly, these lions are like, uh, they're also like, huh. And they're like, hey, hey. Right? Look over there. And Luther's just like, a butterfly. This is great. I don't have anybody pushing me. I don't have anybody shoving me. I don't have any people being mean to me. I'm just over here. And I'm just, I'm enjoying my freedom. I'm completely alone. And the lions are like now starting to drool, like, oh, Luther, look at him. Like, like, Luther's not with the pack. And the, and, and the wildebeest are like, Luther, get back here. Get back here. It's not safe over there. But Luther's already gone. You know, he's like, oh, this butterfly. But this butterfly, right? And it's like floating, this butterfly. And the lions are like, hey, guys, do you see this, right? And so the, the lions start creeping. And, and you're watching this unfold. Everybody knows what's going to happen, right? Because Luther's already too far away. And, and all the mature, um, you know, wildebeest are like, Luther, 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 get over here, get over here. But they're not going to go get him, right? Because they know. They know what happens when you leave the herd. So they're all sticking over here. And the lines creep and creep and creep and creep until the lines get close enough. And then that moment happens, right? <laughs> I got all that, right? And Luther's like... Why is my leg over there, right? <laughs> That's what happens, right? Why are those guys eating my leg over there? Or why, are those, why does the person have my arm? I, and, and so, and Luther gets destroyed, but because he left the group. See, because when you leave the group, all of a sudden, you are like in a place where you don't have the safety being in a large group. You're away from the group, and, you, and all of a sudden, you're in a place where you're alone. 
And the Bible talks about this. Peter writes this. He writes, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, he does what? He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to what? To devour. Yeah. This is, this is reality. And, and you'll see it if you've been in church for any amount of time. You see this. You see people who decide they don't need the church and they go away from the body of Christ and they become cold and they're vulnerable. There is safety in numbers and it's a huge thing. You know, and I was looking at, I was just, I was looking up stuff about safety um, and I found these stats I thought were interesting. Here's the stats. Accidental death stats. 20% of all fatal accidents occur in automobiles. 17% of fatal accidents occur at home. 14% of fatal accidents happen to pedestrians. 16% of fatal accidents happen in planes, trains, or boats. 0.001% of all deaths occur in church. <laughs> Right? I mean, go to church. <laughs> right? It could save your life. It could save your life, really. I mean, it's just, if, here's the thing. If you're, looking, if you're looking for a restart for 2016, I just think you need to remember what we kind of started this whole message with, which is this, the most effective way to make changes in your life is through the support and encouragement of other people. It's just true. You need people around you, and people around you will make you a better person. They'll make you a more faithful follower of Jesus. They'll strengthen and encourage you. They'll help you when you get off track. And that might be a little painful, but you'll still be in the group. It's huge. So as we talk about where to go from here, here's a couple of next steps that I just want to you know, put out in front of you. I'm not sure where you're at in your faith walk, but Here's one thing. I'd say if you, you know, are, are, are an occasional attender, I'd say make church attendance a priority. Commit to being at church every Sunday. You will be a better person for it. People who attend regularly, their faith tends to be stronger than people who don't attend regularly. I'd say, the, I'd say you know, maybe the next step for you is pizza with the pastor. Maybe you're new and you're going, I don't really know what this church is about. You know, now they're talking about getting in a group. If you want to connect with anybody, pizza with the pastor is a great first step because you get to know some of the leaders and some of the people in our church. So it's just a great first step. You also get to meet other people who have been coming to the church who are newer to it. I'd say think about leading a life group. Maybe you're at a place where you've been a part of the church for a while. You've never been, really been a part of a group. Or maybe you've been in a part of a group and thought it was great. Um, I want to challenge you to think about hosting or leading a life group. If that's you, there's going to be a meeting next week. And if you stay after for lunch, you'll hear about what we're going to try to do with life groups to make it a little bit better than it has been in the past. And maybe you'll think, hey, is God calling me to lead a life group? Maybe that's what God wants from you. The last thing I'd say is, you know, we talk about hiding God's word in your heart. Maybe you want to start with memorizing a verse, just a simple verse. 1 Peter 5.8. It's the one that says, be self-controlled and alert for the enemy prowls like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And it's a great one to just remind yourself of that there's strength in numbers, there's strength in the community of God. And I don't know what God's calling on your heart this morning, but I do know this. The local church has been one of the most powerful organizations in the history of the world. And has the church had issues? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Huge ones, right? Um, and the church will continue to have issues because we are a flawed fellowship. We are a people who have issues, and um, there's, we, we're, we're sinful people who get together to worship God. And so we will never be perfect. But what better place than the place that God established, that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and it's going to change this world. We have the opportunity to change our worlds. Your circles that you hang around with, the people who are in your circle of influence, the people that you go to school with and that you work with and that are in your communities. We have the power to change your lives through the local church. So I, I just really would encourage you, find out what your next step is. Decide to take a risk. For some of you, you may go, boy, you know, I attend, but I don't know if I could ever go to somebody's house to get in a group. That just seems too weird, right? But maybe God is calling you this morning and say, hey, maybe you need to think about being part of a group. Maybe it will change your life. Maybe it will make you a, a different kind of believer than you've been in the past. Um, that's what the Bible tells us it will. So let's try to take God at his word. I'm challenging you, right, today? We're starting life groups. Life group signups will happen in February. Um, they'll launch March 6th. 
So we're going to be get, gathering together leaders and hosts, and then we'll start signups in February, and we'll launch them in March. Um, a really, really great avenue for God to move in our congregation as we connect in smaller groups. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day, and Lord, I thank you for every single person that's here. Lord, we want to honor you with our lives, and we want to be all that you want us to be. So, Father, I pray that as we um, just, just close the service today, Father, that if there's something that you want to, us to think about or a, a move that you want us to make, I pray that you would make that clear to us this morning. Lord, we just want to give our lives to you, and we want to make some changes in our life. As we continue to pray, if you are feeling like, I need to make a change in my life, and, um, and I need help to do it. So I'm going to be looking for people in my life to help me make this change for 2016. If that's you, I just want to pray for you today. Just raise your hand real quick and I'll pray for you. Yep, in the back there. Yep, right up in the front. Over here, thank you. Anybody else? Lord, I thank you for the individuals that raised their hand. And Lord, they are looking to make changes in their life. Lord, they're sensing that they need to make a move or a step or a decision. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help them to move in the right direction. That your Holy Spirit will give them guidance to the perfect thing. And Lord, as you unfold your plan for them, that they'll be faithful to walk through the doors that you open for them. Lord, for the rest of us, I pray, Lord, that we would think about our lives and continue to want to serve you with our, all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength. And God, may you be the priority of our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.